Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on April 30th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Today, we're going to talk about health care. Later on in the show, we'll talk to a doctor who is helping to put a question on Florida's 2026 ballot to expand Medicaid with a state constitutional amendment. So I hope you stay tuned for that. First up, though, we're going to talk about how you can get coverage right now, and we're going to do that with our guest, Katie Roters-Turner, Executive Director of Family Health Care Foundation. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Katie. Thank you so much for having me back. It's always a pleasure. I'm glad you could join us. So first, before we get too much further, let's talk about your group, the Family Health Care Foundation. What is that? Thank you so much. So the Family Health Care Foundation is a nonprofit, and we've been in Tampa Bay for over 25 years with a vision that Everyone in Tampa Bay has equitable access to high quality and affordable health care services. And we have navigators across Tampa Bay that help anyone with one on one application assistance for uh, publicly funded programs like Florida Kid Care, could be Medicaid, the health insurance marketplace, or Hillsborough County Health Care Plan. And so all those terms are things that we're going to be going in depth about in the next 25 minutes or so. So, um, and before we get to those solutions for how people can find health care coverage, let's talk about the problem first. How big of a problem is it? What do we know about how many Floridians have are lacking health insurance coverage and especially about how many are getting dropped from Medicaid rolls? Well, so it's hard to put really a finger on the number of uninsured in this very moment because we know that so many have lost uh, health insurance coverage in the last year. Um, well over 1 million Floridians have been dropped from Medicaid coverage, some because they're no longer eligible for Medicaid coverage and others because perhaps they missed a deadline or didn't receive a letter on time. Um, so we do know that we've seen a big surge in people who don't have insurance coverage right now um, or who may not even realize that they're uncovered. So our goal at Family Healthcare Foundation and the partners we work with are to ensure that as many people are aware of their options for coverage as possible, and that we help them get into those programs without as much tr trouble as possible. And on that subject of people getting dropped from Medicaid rolls, I'm gonna talk about a trial that's gonna happen next month. I'm not sure how much you can add to that because that's not really uh, your subject area, but I just wanna make sure that people are aware of things like this. A federal judge has scheduled a trial for May 13th in a lawsuit over people being dropped from Florida's Medicaid program after the end of the COVID-19 federal public health emergency. Attorneys for Medicaid beneficiaries filed a potential class action lawsuit in August. They alleged that the state was not properly informing people before dropping them from Medicaid. I'm sure you don't want to get into the technicalities of the legal aspects of this, but just kind of illustrating the point, what are you hearing from people about as you mentioned earlier, uh, getting dropped from Medicaid, but maybe without very much notification? Well, I think one of the issues was that many people did not understand why they even had Medicaid. Um, with the pause of active Medicaid redeterminations in response to COVID-19, we saw the number of those enrolled in Medicaid really climb to a record that we hadn't seen before. Many families became eligible without really knowing why. And so then losing that coverage probably was jarring or surprising for them as well. And then having to identify what other programs could they be eligible for, incredibly confusing and overwhelming. And I know for myself as someone, you know, as a, as a parent, receiving letters in the mail on top of everything else that's going on in life, you know, and if you've moved or you know, if there's been a change in your household, it's a lot that occurred over the last three years that kind of brought us to this point. So let's talk about the options that people have. Um, one of them might be signing up for the Affordable Care Act Health Insurance Marketplace. Is there an enrollment period that's happening now? So great point. So um, due to the Medicaid redetermination process, for anyone who's lost Medicaid coverage uh, since the spring of 2023, they actually could enroll in the health insurance marketplace all the way until November 30th of 2024. So a really, really wide range of time. Um, someone actually could enroll in a plan today that becomes effective as of tomorrow, which is May 1st. Um, so that's wonderful. So if you've lost Medicaid coverage or you're going to be losing Medicaid coverage, now would be a great time to look at the health insurance marketplace to see if you qualify for financial assistance to help enroll in that platform. Uh, there's all other options as well. There's some county-based programs that we could talk about as well that may offer a no-cost or very low-cost option in addition to the marketplace as an option. 
you know, let's take one of one at a time and uh, going back to the marketplace option. That's something that your group helps people to do. So it may seem like an overwhelming task to kind of consider all the different plans and all of your, uh, you know, what kind of financial uh, help you might be able to get for those plans. But it's really kind of as easy as just calling your group, the Fam Family Healthcare Foundation, to get uh, help from a navigator. What does a navigator do in that situation and how can people get in touch with them? So navigators will help people identify if the health insurance marketplace is the best fit for them, help them fill out the application on healthcare.gov, which is the federal government's platform to shop for insurance and apply for financial assistance. And then also they'll help them compare plans side by side. So in Tampa Bay, in most of the counties that we cover, uh, there's about seven different insurance carriers and over 150 plans to choose between, which is amazing to have all of those options, but again, could be overwhelming. So that's why navigators who are unbiased, who are confidential, and will always provide free assistance year round are a great resource to help look at all those possibilities. And your group is called the Family Healthcare Foundation. What's the way that people can get in touch with them? And as well, I'd like to ask if they're if you're not in the greater Tampa Bay area, maybe you're listening somewhere else in Florida, how can you find out that you're actually talking to an, a real navigator and not someone trying to pose as one to, to get your business for something? Thank you. So Family Healthcare Foundation, our phone number is 813-995-7005. Our website where people can schedule appointments online is familyhealthcarefdn.org. We also work throughout Tampa Bay with Baycare Health System, Tampa General Hospital, Evra Health, which is in Pinellas, and then Premier Community Healthcare in Pasco and Hernando. So there's over 30 navigators in Tampa Bay providing free assistance. And if you're outside of the Bay Area, we are a part of a larger Covering Florida statewide initiative that's funded through USF's College of Public Health. And so if you go to their website, coveringflorida.org, you'll be able to find a navigator entity near you and wherever you live in Florida. Our guest is Katie Roders turner the executive director of Family Healthcare Foundation. And we're talking about options for finding health coverage. Again, later in the show, we're going to hear about a campaign to add Medicaid expansion to the Florida Constitution. So I hope you stay tuned for that. I'm Sean Canan, and this is Tuesday Cafe. We're bring, bringing this to you from the studios of WMNF Tampa, and we're live here on April 30th. So if you'd like to text us or email or phone us with your question, or if you have an experience of maybe getting dropped off these roles and you want to share that with others, here's the number, 813-239-9663. You can also text us at 813-433-0885 or email dj at wmnf.org. So uh, you mentioned the special enrollment periods for people who have been dropped from Medicaid roles, but what about, are, aren't there certain life events that can happen that no matter what your situation is, if, if th these things happen to you, you can also uh, join the healthcare marketplace? Yeah, absolutely. So any kind of qualifying life event, so having a baby, getting married, moving, losing other coverage, maybe you went through a job change. These are all opportunities to look at the healthcare.gov, to work with a navigator and see if you can enroll in a health insurance marketplace plan right now. As I mentioned today, being the last day of the month, you can enroll up until midnight and still have coverage that begins the first day of the month following that. So it's, I would, if anyone's had any types of changes or is looking for affordable insurance, there's no reason to not go to healthcare.gov and take a look. And I, I'm going to bring in a statement that I got emailed from a member of Congress. So again, since it's political, you probably won't be able to comment directly on the opinion that this Congress member is taking, but maybe you can. Uh, uh, we can talk about some of the points that she made. Last Thursday, Congress member Kathy Castor and the Florida Democratic Congressional Delegation sent a letter urging the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, that's also called CMS, to step in to stop Governor DeSantis and the state of Florida from in their words, in the words of this letter, ripping health coverage away from tens of thousands of children who already who currently rely on the Children Health Insurance Program, known as Florida Kid Care. And uh, she, the, the letter goes on to say a newly enacted federal reform requires all states to maintain continuous coverage for children under 19 for one year 
after they've qualified for Medicaid and CHIP. Since the new law went into effect in January, Governor DeSantis in the state of Florida have wrongfully, and this is in the words of the letter, wrongfully cut off 22,500 children from the care they need. And this um, got, got the attention of The Guardian, the newspaper in, in England, and uh, they were pointing out that um, that the administration of Republican Governor Ron DeSantis challenged the rule in federal court in Tampa, arguing that it makes CHIP an entitlement program that illegally overrides a state law requiring monthly payment of premiums. So let's t take the politics out of that, Katie, and just kind of what what do you know about these 22,500 children who have don't have access to CHIP anymore? And what are their options? So for us, if we encounter a family where a child has lost coverage, our first our first act is to screen the family to see what programs that child should be eligible for. So if it's going to be Medicaid, we'll help that family get that child back into Medicaid. If it's going to be within another Florida Kid Care program, like the subsidized or even full pay programs that offer affordable out-of-pocket expenses, we'll help them apply for that too. Our role is to really help get families as quickly as possible into the program that's going to get their kids access to coverage. What is Florida Kid Care? Maybe we should back up and just kind of mention that and chip. Absolutely. So Florida Kid Care is the state's umbrella brand for uh, the Florida's Children's Health Insurance Program. So it's a vehicle that will help most all Florida children get into health care coverage, depending on the family's household and income size. So it could be Florida Medicaid, which provides a no cost option for kiddos, maybe Florida uh, subsidized kid care, which offers a lower out of pocket expense for families that have income that's too high for Medicaid. And then even if families are of moderate or higher income, they could get access to Florida kid care through what's called a full pay program. And in that Guardian article from yesterday that I was reading earlier, Joan Alker, the executive director of the Nonpartisan Center for Children and Families and a research professor at the Georgetown McCourt School of Public Policy, said in an analysis that was published last week that while Florida is not alone in rapidly disenrolling children from Medicaid during the unwinding process, many of whom likely remain eligible, families should know that Florida is distinguishing itself in an apparent violation of federal law by kicking children off chip as well. So that's, uh, I'm not asking for your comment about that. I just wanted to make sure that I read that from the Guardian uh, newspaper about how Florida is is uh, treating children that are getting, that previously got health insurance through this chip program called Florida Kid Care. And uh, uh, this analyst says that Florida is kind of apparently violating federal law, in her opinion, and by kicking these Florida kids off. So you've talked about other options there are besides the federal Obamacare program, what we, what we also call the health insurance marketplace on healthcare.gov, because a lot of local counties, including Hillsboro, and maybe you can tell us what some of the others are, have their own programs that lower income residents are eligible for. Let's start with Hillsboro, since that's our largest county in the area. Tell us about that program, how people can, can uh, find out more about it, and then talk about some of the other counties in the area as well, please. I would love to. So Hillsborough County offers a no-cost program for Hillsborough County residents with qualify, uh, qualifying income and assets. Um, it's, it's a phenomenal program uh, that's provided by Hillsborough County Healthcare Services. Uh, it's accepted at um, so many local clinics to provide uh, com comprehensive managed care. It also includes hospitalization, prescription drugs, eye care, dental services as well. Um, and it's available again to really any Hillsborough County resident with qualifying income eligibility, asset eligibility, and a few other criteria. Um, but it's uh, there's an online application on Hillsborough County's website. Um, we also, as Family Healthcare Foundation navigators, will help with that application as well, help ensure everyone has all items needed to get into the program as quickly as possible. Um, it's a phenomenal program. It's pretty revolutionary for uh, for the state of Florida. It's awesome. And, and then, then neighboring other counties. counties as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Pinellas County also has a, a safety net program too for uh, lower income Pinellas County residents who are residing within Pinellas County. And then Polk County has a very comprehensive program in addition to that. Uh, Polk County offers uh, very low cost um, out-of-pocket expenses for medical services, but there's no deductibles and there's no monthly fees as well. Um, 
So Polk County also offers a program for lower moderate income residents living in that county. And if you're a member, if you're a resident that is of a county that we haven't mentioned, maybe a good place to start is to go to the website of your own county and see if there's something there that talks about what kind of uh, medical coverage is available. So if we encounter an individual or family living outside of those three counties I mentioned, Hillsborough, Pinellas, and Polk, we are usually helping families either look at Health Insurance Marketplace or Florida Kid Care. And if those options are not a great fit, we're going to connect them with a federally qualified health care center, which will provide lower cost, uh, sliding fee scale medical services. So that's kind of like a, a, a clinic in the neighborhood. Is that what that is? Yeah, usually it's, it's, it's a clinic that's uh, geographically focused um, to provide services for uh, families in a region um, that will provide out of pocket, uh, lower out of pocket expenses for medical services. Our guest is Katie Roders Turner, Executive Director of Family Healthcare Foundation. We're talking about options for finding health coverage. Later on in the show, we're going to hear about a campaign to add Medicaid expansion to the Florida Constitution. I'm Sean Canan, and this is Tuesday Cafe. We're coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And I'm going to play a quick story. It's a half a minute long or so that I played on the morning newscast this morning. It's coming to us from a reporter in Tallahassee, and she's she's saying that a federal judge has cleared the way for a class action lawsuit that alleges that Florida did not properly inform people before dropping them from the Medicaid program after a COVID-19 public health emergency ended. So this is a story about the what we were talking about earlier about the trial that's coming up. And uh, so here's more from Margie Menzel about that story. And we'll be back with just in just a moment with Katie Roters Turner. Marsha Morales Howard has rejected arguments by the state that the case should not proceed as a class action. The lawsuit stems from a process that the state started last year to determine whether more than 5 million people enrolled in Medicaid remained eligible for benefits. The process came after the end of the federal COVID-19 public health emergency, a three-year period when the state effectively could not drop people from Medicaid. The lawsuit seeks to reinstate Medicaid coverage to people until they receive adequate notices of termination. I'm Marty Menzel. So that's a story about how it's it could be a class action lawsuit against the state of Florida for dropping people without giving them proper notice and, and letting them uh, uh, rejoin Medicaid. So again, we're talking with Katie Roters Turner, Executive Director of the Family Health Care Foundation. We're talking about accept, uh, options, that is, for finding health care coverage. And if you're just joining us, maybe the uh, Katie's group, the Family Health Care Foundation, what they do is they have navigators who will help you through the process. Uh, if you don't mind giving out the number and the website again, please, Katie. Absolutely. 813-995-7005. You give us a call, we'll uh, do a quick screening and let you know what programs might be the best fit for you. And then also set you up with a navigator to fill up those applications. And our website is familyhealthcarefdn.org. And when when you're picking out what's best fit for you, the, some of the things that you'll be considering is how much coverage you need, whether you wanna have a high deductible plan, and you, people may be familiar with the coding, the kind of uh, gold, silver, platinum. I don't know if they use platinum, but some of the, those codes. So what do those mean? What are the differences between the plans that people might encounter? Thank you for that question. So as I mentioned, there's about a hundred, over 150 plans in some of the counties in Tampa Bay. So it's a lot to choose from. They are categorized between bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. That usually means um, how much you could expect in out-of-pocket expenses. So if you choose a bronze plan, your monthly premium may be lower. However, if you need a lot of medical care, you may have a higher deductible with that plan. Alternatively, if you choose a platinum plan because you know you're going to have a lot of out-of-pocket expenses due to a chronic health care need, you may want to choose a plan that has a higher premium monthly and you're going to pay less out-of-pocket long-term. There is financial assistance for people if they choose a silver plan based on their income. So if you work with a navigator, we'll help drill all those details down and help you look at plans side by side to really identify what's going to be the best fit for yourself and your family. 
Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show today, Katie, and telling our audience about what their options are for getting health care coverage, especially since so many people are losing health care in, in Florida right now. So thank you so much for coming back on Tuesday Cafe, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. Katie Roders Turner is the executive director of Family Healthcare Foundation, and we're speaking with her about options for finding health care coverage. I'm Sean Canan, and this is Tuesday Cafe coming to you from the WMNF studios in Tampa. We now tune to, to our next segment. It's also about access to health care. There's a new campaign to add Medicaid expansion to the Florida Constitution. And before we turn to our next guest, let's listen to a minute story from our reporter, Chris Young, about this new, uh, this new plan for uh, trying to get it on the ballot. Chris Young says that there's an effort going on now to place Medicaid expansion on the 2026 ballot in Florida. It comes as Florida is one of only 10 states that has not expanded Medicaid. Jake Flaherty is the campaign manager for the organization Florida Decides Healthcare. He hosted a press conference Thursday announcing the initiative. With more than 1.4 million Floridians missing out on essential care this expansion would provide, the need to bring this policy across the finish line has never been greater. Eligibility would expand to adults making at or below 138% of the federal poverty level. 59-year-old Allison Holmes is a full-time caretaker for her disabled son, JJ. But my biggest fear is dying from something that would be survivable if I was just able to get typical annual checkups someone of my age gets. This isn't the first effort to put Medicaid on the ballot, according to Holly Bullard of the Florida Policy Institute. In 2019, we collected enough signatures to trigger a Supreme Court review of our petition, but COVID shutdowns derailed us. The court's closing and new legislation out of Tallahassee made these initiatives much harder. In the legislature, Republican Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo made her stance clear. Medicaid expansion is not going to happen in Florida. The petition needs over one million signatures to make it on the ballot. For WMNF News, I'm Chris Young. Well, thanks to Chris for that report, and uh, we are going to talk about that right now. There is a new campaign to add Medicaid expansion to the Florida Constitution. So our guest on Tuesday Cafe is Mona Mongat, MD, board chair with the Committee to Protect Healthcare. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Dr. Mongat. Thanks so much for having me, Sean. I appreciate you coming on. So first, let me ask you, what is the Committee to Protect Healthcare? Uh, the Committee to Protect Healthcare is a, a national organization that's working to uh, insert the voices of physicians into conversations and issues that uh, will improve access and quality to healthcare to all Americans. Great, thank you. So before we talk about the drive that you are part of to get a constitutional amendment on Florida's ballot to expand Medicaid, let's set up the issue. And, and for our audience who has tuned in since the beginning of the show, we'll have a little bit of a, a, a background about um, how it's going in Florida. So what does Medicaid expansion look like in most other states? And then contrast that with access to Medicaid in Florida. Yeah, so um, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, uh, part of the, you know, one of the pillars of that uh, law was that we were going to increase access to health care, and that was partially going to be done by uh, expanding Medicaid in certain states, in all states, and by uh, offering subsidies through the insurance marketplace um, so that health care would be more affordable. And that was supposed to cover, uh, you know, most people under the age of 65, and then we'd rely on Medicare for the rest of it. Um, in 2012, the Supreme Court uh, heard a case that, and then ruled that Medicaid expansion was, as it was stated in the Affordable Care Act, was an unconstitutional. And so each state then was given the option to expand Medicaid in the way that they felt was um, most important or, or most relevant to their, their uh, constituents. And so now, uh, many years down the road, we are one of 10 states that has not expanded Medicaid. That means our uninsured rate remains around 11 percent which is you know high compared to states that have had that have expanded medicaid and really in the state of florida um it, it's extremely difficult to get medicaid it really is first of all if you are a childless adult uh, and you're not disabled you're not getting medicaid there's no there's nothing you can do to get medicaid um if you are under the age of one you have a pretty good chance of being able to get medicaid you have to your family has to make about 200 percent of the federal poverty level um, if you are one to 18 or, you know, a child, 
um, there is a pretty good chance that you'll either qualify for Medicaid or you'll be able to do Florida Healthy Kids, which is a subsidized uh, type of plan. Pregnant women um, can uh, usually get Medicaid um, up to 200% of the poverty level. Um, and, but if you're an adult and you have a child, you have to make like 26% of the poverty level, which is like, I think, $8,000 a year to be able to qualify for Medicaid. So, you know, these are very small, uh, very narrow um, guidelines that dictate who gets Medicaid. And then without this expansion, there's this huge gap between how much money you have to make to be able to actually qualify for a subsidy on the marketplace. Um, so that leaves a lot of people in this gap where they don't they make too much money to qualify for Medicaid and yet they don't make enough money to qualify for a subsidy to help them to purchase uh, insurance on the marketplace. So it's a pretty dire situation. And even given all that, Florida has decided that it's not going to expand Medicaid. And uh, so you've seen the the effects of the, that lack of coverage firsthand. So can you give us some examples of people who aren't able to get this coverage, but then they come to you or you see them at a clinic or something? And what kinds of what are these what are examples of this when people can't get coverage? Yeah, you know, it's a really, really heartbreaking scenario. Um, when people don't have access to health care coverage, uh, it means that they access the health care system too late in, the, in their disease. So it doesn't mean that they don't get health care, right? So let's say this person has COPD or asthma and they have a chronic disease and they're just, you know, trying to get by and then something happens. They get sick. They get an infection. They have to go to the emergency room because they can't breathe. So now they've accessed this health care system in the most ex expensive place. So they go to the emergency room. They receive emergent treatment. Maybe Maybe they're admitted to the hospital for a few days, they get tuned up, they get sent home. And they get sent home with instructions to follow up with your primary care doctor or your specialist so that we can continue to keep you healthy. And that just isn't going to happen because these people don't have access to continuous chronic disease management. And so, the, you know, they're living, they're living uh, from one medical crisis to the next. Um, in my own practice, I see very often, you know, Medicaid eligibility is, is checked every month. And so there will be patients that I will see in my practice that have Medicaid one month and then for three or four months, they don't have any coverage and they don't show up. So then that means they're rationing their inhalers, they're rationing their, you know, their allergy medicines or their asthma inhalers so that it'll last through those months where they're not going to have coverage. That means they're not able to live you know, their, their healthiest life. That means that they're not able to do the things that they want to do. That means they can't go to work because they're sick. That means they can't, you know, take care of their kids, all of these things. And so this impact is it reverberates through our system. Um, you know, and I think a lot of times people think, oh, well, you don't get access to health care because you don't have insurance. That's your problem. That's not really the case. Because as I said, these people do access the healthcare system, but that cost is carried by those of us that do carry insurance. You know, there's this like hidden tax um, that that we all pay that's built into our premiums because this care has to be paid for somehow. Um, and so it would make much more sense from a uh, uh, medical standpoint to be able to provide continuous care. And it would make financial sense as well to provide health insurance or access to health care to all of these people. Our guest is Mona Manga, MD, board chair with the Committee to Protect Healthcare. She's also helping to organize a petition drive for a Medicaid expansion constitutional amendment in Florida. I'm Sean Canan, and this is Tuesday Cafe. We're coming to you live on April 30th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And I'd like to hear your experiences, or if you have any questions, you can call us at 813 239 9663. You can also email dj at wmnf.org, or you can text 813-433-0885. You mentioned some of the issues with people who have chronic diseases that come to that that are are rationing care. What about someone who has a disease, say like diabetes? How would that impact them not having regular coverage or maybe intermittent coverage? How would that impact them? Yeah, definitely. I mean, diabetes, as you have pointed out, is a chronic disease. It's uh, fairly common in the United States, and it requires constant monitoring. And it's not just checking your blood sugars every day. It's making sure that a specialist is making sure you're on the right medicines. They're checking your levels. They're checking to make sure that all of the diseases that come with diabetes are well managed as well. That means heart disease, that means high blood pressure. Um, and, and we understand that the end result of poorly managed diabetes is 
blindness, kidney disease, amputations of your limbs, all of these things. And so there are real things that patients deal with when they can't access the care that they need. I see this every single day in my practice. I mean, all, you know, all of us that are providing care to patients are struggling with trying to make uh, the right decisions in a, in a system that's fragmented. And so you're trying to piece together healthcare for people. You're giving them samples one month, you're giving them, you know, vouchers and hoping they can get, you know, some assistance from some, you know, <laughs> whoever that might be for that month, but it's uh, extremely frustrating. And, and, you know, I, I do also mention it's, it's so frustrating to practice medicine in that sort of scenario where you know what the right thing is for your patients. You know how to provide good care. You know how to control the diabetes and the asthma and the COPD and the heart disease. And you're just fighting, uh, you know, a battle with the system. You mentioned earlier the hidden costs, and I kind of want to explore that a little bit because the argument that you hear when whenever someone from the state government who's in charge of these kinds of things says, well, we're not going to expand Medicaid in Florida, and here's why, because there's going to be, it'll cost the state some a little bit of extra money or a lot of extra money, however you want to put it, but it'll cost the state to expand Medicaid. But then then I hear you talk about these hidden costs. What, are, what would that be? Um, the rest of us, it seems like maybe the rest of us are paying when someone who doesn't have insurance coverage has to get medical care. Yeah, definitely. So that, that hidden cost is, you know, there have been analyses that show that um, the care that is provided to uninsured patients is paid for. It's not paid for by that person. It's paid for by the rest of us. And so this is an additional uh, fee that's calculated. Not it's, it's not an actual fee, but it's an additional amount of money that's calculated, that's put into the premiums that those are insured that pay for their health insurance it's added onto that. I mean, some estimates have set up to like $1,100 a, uh, a year that we are subsidizing this kind of care. But what's really interesting is that there's a lot of, of um, you know, data because many states have now expanded Medicaid um, that shows that there is actual cost savings to this. Um, there's a study that says the Florida's budget would benefit $200 million, cost savings of $200 million to anywhere between $200 and $385 million as a result of expanding. Um, it, it, the, the thing to understand is that when we pay federal taxes, that, that tax money um, is being sent to other states that have expanded Medicaid. We are not getting that share of that money that we've paid in taxes. And what's special about Medicaid expansion at this point is that it is uh, the state's share is much less than it is when you have traditional Medicaid. Um, so in a traditional Medicaid scenario, uh, the state covers, um, I think it's around 65 cents on the dollar. And uh, I'm sorry, the state covers like 38 cents on a dollar and the federal government pays like 65 cents on the dollar. If you are talking about this Medicaid expansion, it's more of a 90-10. So the state's share is much smaller. It's like 10 cents on the dollar, whereas the federal government's paying that, that bulk of the cost. And so it's a win-win for the state. Um, it brings money into the state. It helps um, low-income workers be more productive. It keeps people at work when they have work injuries. It infuses a lot of money into the state. It helps rural hospitals in the state remain open and keep their doors open, and uh, you know, which is incredibly important. So the the economic impact is huge. Brings jobs, brings money. Uh, I, I have a hard time when people say, you know, Florida, Florida's legislature say that um, that you know we can't afford to do this. We really can't afford not to expand Medicaid. So Florida hasn't expanded Medicaid and your group, the group that you're affiliated with is taking this route to get Medicaid expansion put into Florida's constitution. So why did you choose that route? And um, how, yeah, how are you gonna go about that? Yeah, so you know, it would have been easier if the Florida legislature had been able to get their act together and pass Medicaid expansion. It seemed like it might have happened like in 2013, maybe 2014, maybe even 2015. And then, you know, it, it's just uh, leaving it up to those in Tallahassee to do the right thing and expand Medicaid is not working. So this is truly a citizen's initiative. It is a campaign that's, it's got concerned individuals, it's got, uh, providers, it's got labor advocates, policy experts. There's a huge executive committee to this campaign. It's um, Florida Voices for Health, SEIU, the Florida Policy Institute, Catalyst Miami, Unidos US, 
Central Florida Jobs with Justice and Planned Parenthood. Um, and you know, it's it's not an easy task that we have ahead of us. Um, we have to collect around uh, close to a million signatures, um, and uh, that that bar changes. Um, it's about eight percent of the turnout from the previous presidential election, so we'll know the exact number. But it's around a million. Um, and then after those signatures are verified, then the Supreme Court of Florida has to ensure that the uh, ballot language is um, acceptable to be placed on the uh, on the ballot. Um, and then you have to get at least 60% uh, of, uh, um, of the votes to, to pass this uh, ballot initiative. So it's not something that, that, it's not an initiative that's been taken lightly it, it, and it is only because every other avenue uh, that would be legislative and would be sitting in Tallahassee, they have been unable to do this job. And so now the citizens have to do this job. And people might be thinking that, okay, Florida is a conservative Southern state. And so states like that are, are the ones that are not expanding Medicaid. But I found out that Medicaid expansion has gained renewed momentum in other Southern states, like the, the House in Mississippi has passed it. Lawmakers in Georgia are seriously considering it for the first time. So how is it that Georgia and Mississippi are thinking about Medicaid expansion and it's just completely off the table in Florida. Yeah, it's really incredible to me. I mean, North Carolina has passed this expansion. Utah has so many states that you wouldn't expect um, have been able to do this. Some have been able to see the light from a legislative standpoint. Some have required these sorts of citizen efforts. Um, but I, I think we understand here in Florida, uh, definitely, that there is a lot of support for this. Um, this is likely to be a, uh, a bipartisan issue and one that um, when, when we talk about the real impacts that Medicaid expansion has, I think Floridians will recognize and understand that this is a win-win for the state. It's a win-win from so many different, um, you know, financial, financially and medically. And, uh, and so I, I'm very optimistic that we can make the same thing happen in Florida that's happened in many other conservative states. I guess Desmona Mongat, MD, board chair with the Committee to Protect Healthcare. She's helping to organize a petition drive for a Medicaid expansion constitutional amendment in Florida. It wouldn't be on the ballot this year. It will be two years from now. I'm Sean Canan. This is Tuesday Cafe, and we're coming to you live on April 30th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And you can email us if you'd like to tell us your experiences with Medicaid or healthcare in Florida, or if you have any questions. And David writes, thanks for the show today. He says, I feel that Florida Republicans who target Medicaid cuts are simply heartless, that they're doing it for political points with the Trumpster crowd. The Trumpster diver is what he says crowd. I think it's shameful, but not terribly surprising. And David asks, what does your guest think about a universal health care option like that that exists in Canada and the UK? Dr. Manga? I think that's, uh, I really appreciate that, that comment. Um, and uh, I, I hope that we will be able to push through some of these, um, the, the stigma that's associated with Medicaid expansion. Um, and I think uh, any sort of system that gets us closer to every American having access to healthcare is a good thing. Uh, some seem more attainable than others uh, based on our current political climate. And so I'll leave it at that. Earlier, you talked about the coverage gap. So um, maybe you can explain that a little bit more. And the, your, the group that you're with it's that wants to get petitions says it's that closing the coverage gap would save Florida an estimated $200 million a year. I think that's something that you, maybe you mentioned a, a minute ago. And it would be a uh, benefit to the local economy, reduce disparities, and give hardworking Floridians the security of coverage. So when you're saying the coverage gap, um, I know you mentioned it earlier, but maybe you could clarify that, please. Yeah, it's it's definitely it's this this very terrible place to be, where you um, you know m the vast majority of people that are um, that would benefit from Medicaid expansion right now are working people. So these are people that go to work. They are um, uh, disproportionately in service industry jobs. So these are the people that are working at restaurants and construction sites and, and, and motels and hotels and you know all these things, people that keep our economy moving and our, our daily lives comfortable and they just don't make enough money. Um, and they make 
too much money sometimes to qualify for Medicaid, and they don't make enough money to receive these subsidies from the federal government to help them to purchase private health insurance on the marketplace. And the numbers are really pretty um, you know, shocking. So a parent who has a minor child, they have to, so that's, so two parents and a three person household, they can't make more than $8,000 a year to qualify for Medicaid. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's absolutely insane. And yet they have to make at least $25,000 a year to qualify for a subsidy to help them to buy that insurance. So there's this huge gap there. And what are you supposed to do? These people are working. They're contributing to the economy. They're taking care of their kids and their families. And yet there's this huge barrier. And so they're the ones that are delaying their care. They're the ones that are prioritizing, you know, their, their kids' health and their, you know, um, they're the ones that they get hurt on the job and they go to work because they don't have health insurance. They don't know how to get better. They've got to, uh, they've got to do this. These are the people that are putting off these cancer screenings. These are the people that don't have access to family planning services. These are people that don't have access to mental, mental health providers that, that they may need. They have chronic conditions. I mean, chronic conditions don't discriminate, right? And so they're the ones with They've got diabetes and COPD and heart disease, and they can't um, access the medications they need or the care that they need uh, to do better. We know that Medicaid expansion increases access to care, obviously. It improves the quality of care, and we have data that, that shows us that the outcomes are better for people who have access to Medicaid. So, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a heartbreaking scenario, and Medicaid expansion is a lifeline for these people. Since we're talking about Medicaid expansion, maybe now would be a good uh, time to talk about how does Medicaid work in Florida? What is it like, uh, for example, if you're a patient that has Medicaid and you want to go to a doctor, or if you're a doctor and you are um, you have some patients who have Medicaid, what is how how does that all work? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I uh, in I have a solo private practice, and twenty percent of my population is Medicaid. So I am contracted with Medicaid, just like I am with any other health insurance plan. And in Florida, we have many private um, Medicaid uh, uh, administrators. And so uh, you sign a contract with these people as a provider, and they tell you that you're going to be reimbursed a certain amount of dollars for the care of these patients. Um, and, uh, you know, it typically and in general, Medicaid reimbursement rates are not as good as commercial reimbursement rates. They're not, they're not awful, but they're not great. Uh, from a patient standpoint, um, there are a lot of choices in Florida because we have privatized Medicaid. So, uh, patients have to sort of navigate and figure out which plan looks best for them, almost like they were shopping on a marketplace for, uh, commercial insurance. Um, one of the limitations of Medicaid in Florida is that the uh, networks for their providers are sometimes narrow, especially when we talk about specialists. So, you know, um, I have patients that come to see me all the way from Bradenton to, I, I don't even know, um, what are some of those cities? I, very far north. You know, people are driving hours to come to, to see a Medicaid provider because, um, the networks are just tight. And, and part of that is that um, many physicians feel like the reimbursement rates are not um, to par with the, the private companies. And, and sometimes it's just because um, that is how we restrict care, right? The insurance company decides that, okay, we only put two, um, you know, two heart doctors on there. So that's all there is. So you're, you want to see them that you're gonna you know, make the effort to see them. So it is sometimes challenging to access that care. I think unfortunately there's stigma associated with Medicaid and that is something, uh, you know, a place for, uh, that requires education of both providers and patients and, you know, community in general. Um, our philosophy here at our practice is that, you know, every person who comes here, whether they have insurance or not, are gonna be treated the same and they're gonna get the same high quality of care. And I think that's that's something that we should uh, really be talking more about. You know, that's interesting that you talked about the stigma around Medicaid. And I wonder if this whole debate about not expanding it and uh, it contributes to that and whether part of that might be alleviated if Medicaid is expanded in Florida. Do you have thoughts about that? 
Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, actually. I mean, this stigma, uh, I think, is, you know, there's this narrative that people who have Medicaid, they don't, you know, they don't want to work and they just want to get free health care and all of this. And that that just the numbers just don't bear that out. The people that have Medicaid are the hardest, you know, they're working. The vast majority of them are working and doing the jobs that have to be done. Um, and I think that the more we understand and we recognize how Medicaid expansion benefits us globally as a population um, and the state in general, I, I'm hoping that the stigma will will be reduced. Um, and I do agree, probably by expanding and having more uh, more um, patients on the rolls of uh, of the Medicaid rolls, uh, it should hopefully help reduce that stigma. And it could potentially even uh, change the the reimbursement rates, and that maybe the doctors wouldn't be as afraid of taking taking on Medicaid. Very much so. Very much so. You know, you talked earlier about the, the the hurdles that you have to go through to get this on the ballot in the first place, all the signatures, maybe a million signatures or so, and then, of course, getting it passed. But um, I, I saw a survey that happened in March of 800 likely general election Florida voters, and 68 percent of them said they support closing the coverage gap through state legislation or through a constitutional amendment. So that might bode well for your effort if uh, if 68% of Floridians actually support expanding Medicaid, that if you can take get through all those hurdles and get this on the 2026 ballot, which I think is your goal, then it might have a good chance of passing the 60% threshold. Yes, I, I think that those numbers are very promising um, and they suggest bipartisan support of this initiative. Um, you know, I think what's interesting is that um, uh, Governor DeSantis signed a law recently, in recent years, that makes this whole process of gathering signatures even harder. Um, and despite that, I think that we will um, uh, hopefully be able to collect these million signatures. I think we've already collected uh, 5,000 internally, and that's just starting in February without, you know, much of a push and and uh, much, um, much fundraising, uh, not much fundraising has occurred yet. So, yeah, I feel pretty optimistic. Um, and I think that the people will speak and um, and I hope those in Tallahassee are listening and, and recognizing that there is an incredible desire to do right by Floridians and, and, and to, you know, to catch us up to most of the rest of the country um, in terms of having access to care for all Floridians. It might be too early in the process to answer this question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Do you have an idea of how the signature gathering will play out, whether it will be just a few um, activists gathering signatures or whether you'll hire signature gatherers? That's a very expensive uh, task, but the ones that end up getting on the ballot, it seems, are the ones that do end up spending millions oftentimes to hire um, people to, to gather signatures at public events. Do you know how your campaign will play out? I'm sorry, I don't know. I can't comment on that because I really don't know the internal workings of that. Um, I do know that uh, what you say is is extremely true. It, it requires a lot of money to get this number of verified signatures. It usually requires people that are hired to do this job. Um, and that requires fundraising, political action committees, things like that. So um, uh, I don't have the answers, but I'm, I'm assuming that that would be the path that this uh, coalition will be taking as well. My next question has doesn't have to do with the Medicaid expansion or anything, but it was a, it was it showed up in my e email box about a program in Florida in, that has to do with Medicaid, and so maybe you can enlighten me. And it's also very likely that you don't know anything about this, but per, it's possible that if our audience, uh, there might be people in the audience who could take advantage of this. And so, if so, let me know if you if you know anything about this. The email said the Medicaid program in Florida is subsidizing what are called minor home modifications or MHMs for eligible seniors. This initiative aims to enhance the quality of life for older adults by making their homes more accessible and functional. Do you happen to know anything about that in Medicaid and, and having people be able to make their homes more accessible? I do not. Uh, I'm not aware of that program. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't comment on that. It does, though, remind me of something that I did want to mention. Um, there is an interesting permutation to Medicaid in Florida. There's a program called the Share of Cost Program, which I think is interesting to share um, with your listeners. There's a scenario whereby 
um, if, a, if an uninsured patient in the state of Florida uh, undergoes some sort of medical crisis or, or you know, accesses the medical, medical system, um, there's a threshold that they can meet, and this is based on their gross income and their assets. Um, and if they meet that threshold, so let's say, for example, you get in a car accident, you don't have health insurance, you go to the hospital, you break your arm, and they give you a bill for like $900, and you have a share of cost threshold of $800. So you've met that threshold. Now Medicaid kicks in for that from that day till the end of the month. And so it's an interesting scenario where... Um, there are, I've met many patients who will come in and they'll say that exact story. Well, I was in a car accident, I broke my ankle. Now my Medicaid kicked in for the next 15 days. Can we work on my asthma? And, you know, while it's great that they're able to access that care for that limited amount of time, it's also very frustrating because you'll say, oh my gosh, yes, you're here. Now we need to do X, Y, and Z. We need to get you on this medicine and do this test. And we have 15 days to do it. And so it's like this mad rush. And then you know, the first of the next month starts and they no longer have health insurance. And so that share of cost is not met. Um, it, it's actually a very, I think it's an extremely perverse system that's been put in place, but it may benefit some patients. And uh, it's something interesting, I think, that's specific to Florida. So during this interview, we've laid out a lot of the issues about how many people are uninsured, how many people might be eligible for Medicaid if it were expanded, but they're not. So these people, it seems, are in a real bind about health insurance and getting health care. So uh, what would you recommend if someone is there and they have they would love to be able to um, be uh, eligible for Medicaid in Florida, but they're not just because it hasn't expanded? What would you say to them about what they should do about taking care of their health, whether it's um, uh, uh, yeah, what what are what are some things they can do about either finding alternative insurance or finding medical health without insurance? I wish that there was an answer. I wish I could tell you we'll go to this website and and you'll be able to get health care somehow. But uh, I I unfortunately don't have an answer for those people. I feel that um, we are in a, a very very difficult scenario and situation. People, um, obviously, you can tell them to live as healthy as they can and, you know, access good food and exercise and all that, but that sort of seems, um, uh, you know, a bit, um, I don't know, it just doesn't seem like it's really going to do much at this point. I think the best thing we can do is try to vote and vote with our, um, these sorts of choices in mind and understand that collectively uh, a, a citizen effort can be effective and it can get us to the place where we need to be. So make sure you're registered to vote, make sure you vote in the election and make sure you keep your eyes open for this ballot initiative that's coming because it will help all Floridians. Where can people go to find out more about your ballot initiative to add Medicaid expansion to the Florida constitution? That's a great question. I don't have the website for you, but I will supply it to you after the call. And maybe you can share it with your listeners. Yeah, and we'll put it on our website, WMNF.org. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on Tuesday Cafe, Dr. Mongat. Thanks for having me, Sean. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Mona Mongat, MD, is a board chair with the Committee to Protect Healthcare. She's part of a group helping to hoping to add Medicaid expansion to the Florida Constitution. I also want to thank my earlier guest, Katie Roders Turner, with the Family Health Care Foundation. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly will host Midpoint. Coming up next is the award-winning Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. Their guests will talk about Tampa Bay's housing affordability crisis. Then coming up at noon is Wide Awake America with host Nadine Smith. Her guest is Christine Keneally, an award-winning journalist whose latest book is called Ghosts of the Orphanage. It documents a decades-long journey into the dark corners of child abuse within Catholic orphanages in the U.S. This has been Tuesday Cafe, coming to you live on April 30th, 2024, from the studios of WMNF, Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, and Lakeland. Thanks so much for listening.